Hi guys, welcome back aboard good old Athena. This week we'll start out with a little DIY project. I'll be installing Garmin's new marine satellite compass, aptly named the MSC-10. Once I've hopefully gotten the MSC-10 up and running, we'll explore this little area we're in right now, and then we'll head over to the next Ria here in Spain. There, we're supposed to haul out next week to take a look at our rudder, and also take care of a few minor jobs. My name is Mess, this is my wife Ava. I've spent the last five years on a somewhat extensive refit of our 1987 Warrior 38 named Athena. That was a DIY fun-packed adventure complete with a very extensive osmosis treatment, building a new rudder using vacuum infusion, rebuilding the entire deck, gutting and subsequently rebuilding most of the interior, painting the top sides and a ton of other projects. The summer of 2021, we started cruising full time. Now we're finally ready to begin our adventure. I have the MSC 10 and I think I also have everything I need to install it. The only thing that's a little bit tricky with this guy for us is gonna to be to find a good spot to install it, but uh, we'll get back to that later. Along with the MSC 10, I also picked up a new seven inch Garmin chat plotter to be installed out by our helm. But to be able to do that, we need a little bit of stainless work done and that's on the job list for when we haul out next week. So what exactly is the MSC-10? The MSC-10 will not only give us a GPS position within, I think it's up to one meters worth of accuracy, which is pretty freaking good. It'll also give us heading information without any kind of magnetic interference. And the MSC-10 will also give us pitch, heave and roll information in rough seas, which I believe our autopilot is able to take into consideration when it's deciding how to behave. Up until now, we haven't had an external GPS antenna. We've solely been relying on the built-in GPS antennas in our chart plotters, and that has worked perfectly fine. But it does mean once the chart plotters are turned off, we don't have any GPS information on the NMEA 2000 network. Also up until now, we've only had one source of heading information for our autopilot, and that's through the CCU or course compute unit that came with the autopilot. That's a separate box. And if that box dies, well, then we can't use the autopilot because there's no heading information. So the MSC 10 is gonna be a nice bit of added redundancy to our autopilot. Not only does the MSC 10 give us heading information based on GPS data within, I think it's two degrees worth of accuracy, it also gives us a backup to that. So in case we, for whatever reason, lose GPS connection, it will still provide heading information. This is a great time to circle back to the somewhat tricky thing about the MSC-10, which is finding somewhere to install it. As per usual, before purchasing a doohickey, I have of course perused the manual thoroughly on the interwebs to make sure that the thing does exactly what I want it to do. It was there I first came across the mounting challenge. The compass must be mounted in a location where it has a clear unobstructed view of the sky in all directions. Select a location that has no objects higher than five degrees above the device. The compass must be mounted where it's not shaded by superstructure, antenna or mast. I'm not gonna lie, finding that location on a sailboat is not really super easy but I hope we'll be able to get away with just mounting the MSC-10 directly to the mast. There's gonna be some shading there, but hopefully it'll be okay. I found this doohickey, which is intended for mounting a antenna on a mast, but uh, the MSC-10 comes with this little adapter here so you can screw onto a standard antenna mount. Also included in the box was one of my all-time favorite things, a mounting template, a little bag of other mounting hardware, and an NMEA 2000 cable. And this feels like a six meter one. This is roughly what the contraption I'm hoping to rivet to the mast is gonna look like. It's gonna sit above our radar so that the radar doesn't shade the MSC-10, and also so that the MSC-10 is protected by the radar if the stay sail comes a flopping. In terms of connections to get the MSC-10 to work, life couldn't be much easier. It works off of NMEA 2000 and is also powered off of NMEA 2000. The radar is all the way up there and I don't wanna bother mounting the MSC-10 up there if it's not gonna work. So for a little test, I've just zip tied it to the mast down here. If it does work, it looks like I'll have to modify this mount just a little bit to get it to conform to the shape of the mast, but that shouldn't be too difficult. 
If I'm able to get reliable data from the MSC-10 mounted here, I see no reason it shouldn't work higher up in the mast. But uh, let's head back down below and see if it works. I've always used a Garmin products, so those are the ones I'm familiar with. But I'm pretty sure all other manufacturers have something akin to what I'll show you. If we go into settings, communication, enemy 2000 setup, and then device list, we can see a list of all the NMEA 2000 devices on the network. And then down somewhere, yep, there it is, the Garmin MSC-10. So the MSC-10 is definitely on the network. Now let's see how it's doing. If we go home and settings and system and GPS, here we can see some information about the position or the accuracy of the GPS sensor. As you might have noticed, it has automatically selected the MSC-10 as the GPS source. And right now we have an accuracy of 1.3 meters. Now if we change the source to the built-in sensor, we have an accuracy of 4 meters. If we go back out to a chart here, I've got the heading selected up here. I'm assuming that's defaulting also to use the MSC-10 heading. We are at anchor right now, so we are swaying about a little bit, but as best as I can see, there are no numbers jumping around randomly or anything like that. So yeah, I think it's okay to mount the MSC-10 on the mast. Let's give it a whirl. After having made a few adjustments with the ankle grinder, checked those adjustments and made yet more tiny adjustments, I finally had a mount that was a good snug fit. Then it was time to go up the mast. After much huffing and a puffing from Ava, I found my little perch on the bottom spreaders. I drilled three holes on each side of the mast and got the mount secured with six rivets. I threaded the MSC-10 onto the mount and secured it in place with the little locking knot. Then it was just a matter of running the NMA 2000 cable inside of the mast. I've connected the MSC-10 to our NMEA 2000 network and it's appeared again in the device list here. So the installation is done. Tomorrow morning, I think we're going to head into town and check that out. But then a little bit later in the day, I think we're going to move to another anchorage. And while we're doing that, we can take care of the calibration of the MSC-10. We are anchored just off of the town of Kambaro, and we've heard it is one of the most beautiful fishing villages here in Galicia. So we thought we'd head in today and check it out. We made it to Granary Row. We first saw the granaries in Camarines and there were local store food and grain to keep dry and away from animals. But here in Cambrero, they have over 60. You can see them lined up over on the coast here and they're supposed to be scattered all throughout town too. Dingy's tied up, let's go. Cambaro is known as a little mariner's town and in Spanish, I really want to say it in Spanish, I've been practicing all morning, it's a Velinia Marineria. Sorry if I butchered it, but it actually dates back to the 17th century and the whole town is built on a giant granite rock. I cannot tell you how much I love this town. I hope the video is doing it justice because it feels like you're walking through a film set of some kind of like mystical town. There's little doors chiseled in the side of buildings and little wood framed windows. I love it. I just found something so cool. It's a little peekaboo window with a miniature granary in it. Cambaro is also known for its crucieros. They are these giant crosses around town. There's about seven or eight of them and they're usually placed in crossroads and that's believed to signify the Christianization of pagan worshipers. They are a little bit intimidating, but I think the most interesting thing about them is that they're known as magic spaces where witches and souls in purgatory held meetings. Woo! 
Ooh. Now for something far less spooky, the calibration of the MSC-10. This calibration, I believe, is only for the magnetic sensor. I don't believe the GPS sensor will need any kind of calibration, but it'd be nice to have that magnetic sensor as a backup, so we better configure it. We're basically in the perfect location to do the calibration. There is no wind and the sea state is completely flat. We'll go communication, anime 2000 setup, device list, we'll find the MSC-10 and review, and then we will go compass calibration. It's telling us to turn the boat 1.5 times in either direction to calibrate the compass, keep the boat level and steady while turning. Let's begin. And just like that, the sensor is calibrated. That was super easy. Now let's head to our next anchorage. A little bit further back in the rear in here, we made some parallel runs while under engine just to make sure that the heading is nice and stable. And so far the MSC-10 seems to perform very well. We've got a whooping 11 miles to our next anchorage. There is not exactly oodles of wind today, but that's okay. We've got all day to make those 11 miles. Before we left Cambaro, we picked up some pedrones, which are just little green peppers. We had some grilled at a restaurant in Camarinas, and they're so good and so easy to make. All you need is pedrone peppers, olive oil, sea salt, a grill, or you could use a stove. The fun thing about these peppers though is that some of them are really spicy and some of them are mild and you never know which one you're gonna get. Oh. <sighs> oh mild. Oh, lucky. Okay, let's see. Big money, no whammy. That looks good. Mild. They're very good. Yeah, they are. Love them. Good morning, guys. We did end up kicking on the engine a few hours later when the wind died down to two knots. But in the end, we made it here to the anchorage. We've had a somewhat rolly night, so we might pull up the anchor and leave in a few minutes. I think I mentioned in last week's video that we're waiting for a wind vane to show up. As far as I know, that is still on track and it should be shipped out in the next two or three weeks, something like that. Now we can either have that delivered to somewhere here in Spain or somewhere in Portugal. But before we can leave Spain, one last little thing has come up. A little while back, while surfing down some big waves, I noticed a sound coming from the rudder, or at least I think it was coming from the rudder. And I think I've also noticed a little bit of added resistance when we're surfing down big waves. I mean, that is to be expected, but more than I would expect. Now, it's probably gonna be okay, but it turns out there's a yard about 15 miles from here where we can haul out. I could just jump in the water with the old trusty scuba gear and check it out, but it will be easier to check out the rudder with the boat up on the hard. So yeah, next week we're hauling out. In a fun coincident, we only actually found the yard here because I was looking for somewhere where we could have a little bit of stainless work done to mount the chat product I showed you earlier. I contacted the yard and they said, yeah, they can help us with that bit of stainless work. And then it turned out that they don't actually have anywhere we can tie up with the boat in the water. So to come there, we have to haul out, which is the perfect opportunity to check out the rudder. I was a little bit scared about the cost of hauling out here in Spain, having been scared by the somewhat high costs of boat ownership in the UK. But it turns out to haul out here is only 130 euros to go up, then it's 14 euros a day to stay on the hard, and then 130 euros to go back in the water. That's pretty good. I mean, it's not as cheap as Denmark, but it's still pretty good. We are right here at the entrance to the last Ria in Spain, Ria de Vigo. I'm probably butchering that, but the, the yard is up here about 15 miles away, right across from the big city of Vigo. One little note of caution about this beach here. It turns out it's a nudist beach. Today is a pretty gloomy overcast day, so we could probably have made landfall here without ever realizing that it is a nudist beach. 
But our friends of our Tailey got here on a nice warm sunny day and they went ashore in their dinghy without knowing about the exposed dangly bits. So uh, yeah, if you come here, just be aware. For finding anchorages, we tend to use an app that's called Navali quite a bit. And uh, looking at that, there should be an anchorage on the other side of Vigo, on the other side of the yard, but that'll put us within a couple of miles of the yard. We're currently out here and tonight it's going to be southerly wind, so it would be nice to find an anchorage on the south side of the rear, relatively close to the yard, which is over here. And that leads me to looking at this little anchorage here, which looks pretty much perfect. This time I tried something new with our light wind snupper here. Previously I've run it out with the chain over by the bow roller. That causes some very loud noises from the chain every once in a while. So yeah, last night I ran it out on this side instead and it's been completely quiet. Maybe when we're up on the hard I could get a big bushing type thing made here so that it's not on such a tight radius there. I think that would be good, but uh, yeah, let's get underway. I just double checked and it's about eight miles to the anchorage and we're gonna be motoring because, well, we wanna get there as fast as possible today. And also it's overcast, so we kinda need to motor to get some juice into the batteries. Of course, we could also just sail to the anchorage and run the gen set. I do think that's a little bit more efficient in terms of turning fuel into energy, but uh, we're due for an oil change on the gen set and I don't have the right type of oil to do that oil change on the boat. So I don't wanna run it for now, but I'm hoping I can get that oil in the yard when we haul out. We've been seeing a lot of these giant platforms here behind me in the rias. I think they are for growing mussels or something like that. They've got little strings submerged from them and yeah, they're not very pretty, but at least I guess they've helped clean the water. And plump, we have made it to the next anchorage. It's not quite as scenic as the other one. There's a big industrial yard here behind us. The anchorage is also kind of small, but it's only us and a Swedish boat here next to us. And we're only gonna be here for a night. So yeah, this is perfect. So next week we swing back into 100% DIY mode. I don't know how long we're gonna be up on the hard. Maybe a week, maybe two. I hope we won't be up there longer than that. But that all depends on how fast the stainless guy is. I feel like we're gonna be an official sailing channel now because we're gonna be living up on the hard in a foreign country for a few days. That is true, that is true. Hopefully we won't be there for too long, but uh, we'll cross our fingers. Mm -hmm. Anyways, we hope to see all you guys back here aboard Athena next week for yet more DIY fun. Mm -hmm. As always, feel free to leave a comment down below and don't forget, if you've enjoyed this video, please remember to leave a like. See, see you. you.